This meeting is being recorded. And if you can, if you are not planning on speaking anytime soon, it'd be great for you to go ahead and mute. So we're limiting background noise. Yes, we will probably mute all um, here and there so that we can hear each other one at a time, of course. All right, we'll just give one or two more minutes and then we'll get rolling. Hi, my name is Lee. I'm on Wabanaki land and Passamaquoddy land and they are still living here. Oh, beautiful. Thank you, Lee. So glad you could join us and bring in the acknowledgement of them. All right, B, you want to get rolling? Oh, you're muted. That's what happens when we mute all. <laughs> ourselves unintentionally. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so yeah, welcome everybody. Um, I am B, and um, I am out here in Brevard, North Carolina. I'm a rites of passage guide, and um, I am also a relative of Callie's. I'm her aunt. And as we say in these parts, aunt and not aunt. Um, and so I'm gonna introduce Callie for this story time that we're getting ready to go into. Um, Callie is also a rites of passage guide and a clinical mental health counselor um, and a lifelong uh, soul healing seeker and dancer and poet and creative and many, many things. Um, and has a heart for supporting others on the journey to find that vibrance in their lives. So it's a privilege to be um, on here as an assistant and uh, moderator with the Zoom stuff. Sometimes I'm challenged with Zoom, so hang in there with me if I end up bumping into some of those challenges. Um, but here's Callie. Thank you, B. Really appreciate you being here and just helping me navigate all the Zoom, the Zoom world of all these boxes of seeing each other. So, yeah, yeah, I really am grateful to be here and. It's a rainy afternoon where I am and a good time for a story. So what we're going to do is we'll just talk a little bit about stories themselves, um, stories as medicine and different ways of engaging with story. And then I'm going to tell all of you this beautiful story of Vasilisa. It's also called Vasilisa the Wise or Vasilisa the Beautiful. Uh, and it's a story, uh, its origins are in Romania, and many of you are probably familiar with Cinderella, which is the patriarchal rendition of Vasilisa the Wise. So there may be some similarities that you notice in this story to our more modern version of Cinderella. It does not have the prince savior in this version. Um, rather, we touch into someone's intuition as their guide, as a way of really a path to initiation. So I chose this story um, just to dive in a little bit more. I chose this story because it really speaks to rites of passage work in a way. And of course, that's what we do here at Rites of Passage Council is uh, we assist people in crossing over thresholds from one stage, from one chapter to the next. And in initiatory stories, um, there are often different sections, different chapters 
And we can also see that in our own lives, in our own mythological story of our personal life. Um, considering that each of us have a, you know, a life story and, and seeing that as a living myth, a living personal myth that is ever changing and evolving. And at different points, when we come up against thresholds and initiatory opportunities, um, that we will often go through four, if we complete it, four uh, chapters, four places. So the first place is severance. And that can often look, it, it can look many ways. Um, in this case, there's a death. So severance is, is really this this ending of one way of life and this opportunity to um, to step into another way. And then uh, and then we have calling. So you're being called into something. You're being called to this other way of life. You're maybe not sure what this way of life is or what you're being called to, but there's something that is pulling you forward. Maybe it is tracking you, maybe you are tracking it, but there's something that's, that is unfolding here and you're being called to it. So as we are severing and being called, we come upon a threshold often in our lives. And this threshold is, is when we think of a, a rites of passage ceremony, um, we also, usually think of the the vision fast or the vision quest, the time out on the land with nature as the ceremony. There's actually a lot that happens before and a lot that happens after. But in that time, um, we, we typically refer to that time as the threshold space. And so in this story, there is a time where Vasilisa is in the threshold betwixt and between in that liminal space. And then there is the return. And the return is sometimes it's very celebratory for people. Sometimes it is very difficult. Uh, you may be returning to a life that no longer speaks to you, that you no longer resonate with. Something changed while you were out there in that threshold space, and now you're returning. And Everything looks a little different. People may look at you a little different. Or other beings may kind of cock their head to the side like, I don't quite know this person anymore. Who is this person? And some might be curious and some might be afraid. And some might be uh, desiring an experience similar to that. So all of that to say, just kind of in a condensed way that there's different stages to this rites of passage experience. And this story is one such story of a rites of passage. So over time, um, through thousands and thousands of years and um, generations, storytelling was an art form. And it was also a way to hold the traditions, the medicine and the teachings of a culture and pass it down. And there was an idea that I really like about stories that stories are living. They are not fixed in time. So if we consider that stories are living and not fixed in time, then it is not so much about understanding every aspect of a story, but engaging with it noticing where you connect, noticing where your attention is really drawn, and maybe also noticing where you leave the story, where suddenly your mind is to your to-do list and all the things that you'll be doing after this story. Noticing where you get hooked in the story and you have no idea what has happened for the last 10 minutes because you stayed at this one point in the story where she was in the woods and there was something happening and you're still there. 
we've gone somewhere else, but you're right there. So I would invite you as we tell this story to engage with the story as a living being, as a living energy and allow it to move through you. I'm simply the, uh, we could say the hollow bone or the conduit for this story and bringing it through as an offering, but the story itself is the medicine that you, for some reason, for whatever reason, have said yes to listening to today or later, you know, this evening or whenever you, you know, listen to the recording if you're not on live right now. So inviting you to just be with the story and notice where you exit, notice where you enter, notice where you stay or go, and what comes alive in you as you hear this. Maybe your own initiatory experience. Notice the emotions that show up. Maybe the sensations in your body. Perhaps the other stories that you are reminded of when you hear this story. So just allowing your Given me heart eyes <laughs> on the chat. Woohoo, let's do it. All right. So I would invite all of you to just maybe close your eyes if you feel comfortable or have a downward gaze and just let yourself connect to your body. And settle in for a journey. So once there was, or perhaps once there was not. Once upon a time, or maybe below time, or perhaps even in between time, there was a girl. Her name was Vasilisa. Now Vasilisa's mother was very ill and was on her deathbed. Vasilisa's mother would be dying soon. And so Vasilisa and her father gathered around her mother's deathbed. And as the mother began to take her ragged last breaths. She beckoned to her daughter. Come here, my child. I have something to tell you. And Vasilisa walked over, knelt beside her mother's deathbed, taking her mother's hand mother's hand, she noticed that there was a doll. This doll was dressed in a white apron with black stockings and red boots. Very much similar to the way that Vasilisa was dressed. Embroidered thread on the vest of this little doll. And the mother said to Vasilisa, this is for you, dear one. Take this doll and carry it with you wherever you go. Whenever you lose your way or, un or are uncertain about which direction to go, consult this doll and she will show you the way. And be sure to feed this doll, feeding her along the way, 
always keeping her with you. This is the blessing that I give to you, daughter. And with that, the mother took her last breath and was dead. Now, Vasilisa and her father, they mourned for a very long time. Summer turned to fall, fall turned to winter, and winter again to spring. And as the flowers bloomed in spring, the father remarried. He remarried a woman and her two daughters. Now, these women, these three women, seemed polite enough. However, there was something that could not be perceived by the father beneath their polite smiles. Something of the rodent, one might say. Now, when these women were alone with Vasilisa, they were very cruel. In fact, they despised Vasilisa. Telling her, you know, we are too pretty and too fragile to do any of these chores to do any of this work. So we will need you to go to the hearth. We will need you to carry the firewood and keep the fire lit. Keep the fire lit. Wash the dishes. Take care of things. And they snickered underneath their breath. Now Vasilisa, being who Vasilisa is, obediently obliged, complied with these, these women and their request, their orders, and did so even in spirit, in joy, humming with the birds, carrying out her tasks, trusting that the birds would show her the way, all the while keeping this little doll in her pocket, thinking of her mother fondly. Now one day, the stepmother and these two stepsisters had grown tired of Vasilisa. the innocence that was otherworldly, jealousy eating away at them. And they conspired. <laughs> we have an idea. What if we let the fire in the hearth go out and we will send Vasilisa into the woods and she will have to get the fire from Baba Yaga. And Baba Yaga, the witch, surely will kill her and eat her. She won't survive. And then <laughs> we will be rid of Vasilisa for good. And they squealed like things in the dark. So that night when Vasilisa came home, she noticed the fire had gone out and she said to her stepmother, stepmother, what shall we do? There's no fire in the hearth. How will we cook our food or keep warm? And the stepmother admonished, you stupid girl, of course there's no fire. And you will have to be the one to go into the woods to get the fire from Baba Yaga, for I am too old and my daughter's well there too afraid. So you 
will be the one. And Vasilisa, being who Vasilisa is, said, well, all right, I will do this. And gathering her cloak, she set out into the woods, into the dark night. So we'll pause here, just as we're getting to this wooded area. And what I'd like to offer is that we will break out into breakout rooms for just a few minutes. And I will pose this question for all of you to Share with one another wherever you are in your breakout rooms. I invite you to just consider where are you in the story? Where are you being lit up in the story? And perhaps what other stories are coming in about your own life or someone else's life that you are being reminded of in this story? And where do you think this story might go? So we'll do that now and we'll come back in just a few minutes. So B, if you wanna. Okay, I've got rooms created and I'm gonna push my create button and see where it goes. Awesome. So open all rooms. I see a couple of people are in a single room, maybe. Let's see. Yeah, maybe we can, if there's anyone who's by themselves, we can. Let's see. Um, maybe add them to a different room. Yeah. Let's see. I'm trying that right now. Move to 11. Um, anybody having a hard time joining a room? Feel I free. We've got about 15 people still needing to join. Let's see. Okay, one person okay. said they're driving, so they're not okay. able to join. No problem. Is it possible to stay in the main room? Certainly. No else will be in the main room, Rainbow Lone Star. So you will be by yourself if you stay. Certainly you don't have to go to a breakout room. Yeah, if you choose not to go to the breakout room, you'll just be... Okay, listening today. Um, I, I went to the breakout room and then I was alone, so I came back. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. yeah, good idea. There's some people choosing not to go into a breakout room and I can't tell who they are. Oh, now I'm seeing. Okay. Um, I will. It's a lot to scan here. Let's see. Make sure that if anybody's alone, I'm going to try to get somebody in there with you. I was also by myself. That's why I'm I'm back. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, me too. <laughs> it's very lonely in these breakout rooms. <laughs> yeah, it's a lot. It's a lot for me to figure out who's alone and who's not, especially for a few minutes. I don't know if we want to just have a, those of us that are in the breakout room now. I mean, in this room. Um. Just want to make sure, Callie, if you, I don't know if, if we want to just ponder your questions in this room while yeah, we I can figure out who's alone. Mm -hmm. Yeah, why don't the people who are here, we can just start a little conversation in this room. We'll just make it a breakout room and see if we can't get some other people gathered while you're, you know, if you want to manage that, B, I'll just 
be here to listen and and add to the conversation. Um, I can add something if. Yeah, if please do, Karen. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> I was thinking about. Um, you know, I think that the part of the story I was most engaged with and like I could feel my body kind of lighting up with emotion was, uh, you know, when the, the stepsisters and, and um, start um, conspiring, you know, for um, to, to bring Vasilisa down, basically. Mm -hmm. And uh, it reminded me of basically a struggle in my own life where I... I um, my own journey is is uh, very much up against the mainstream um, understanding of uh, particularly mental health. And I, I had um, been diagnosed or labeled, I call it. I've been lab I was labeled bipolar when I was 21. And I spent the last couple of years withdrawing from all my medication, finding wellness in like earth-based spirituality and this kind of stuff. And it just reminded me of like the feeling I have where the world wants me to believe a different story about myself, that I'm like permanently broken, mm. that there's no recovery, that there's no meaning to what I went through. And then it just made me feel like those are my stepsisters. It's like the world is, feels like my stepsisters right now trying to uh, lead me away from my, my journey of um, going to Baba Yaga and probably Vasilisa is going to rock it. Like she's going to rock it with Baba Yaga. She's going to make it, you know. Uh, that's where I think it's going. <laughs> but because she has heart, you know, and she... You know, they don't, the sisters don't know that, you know, what it takes to survive these journeys and that Bas Bas Basilisa has it, you know. So anyway, that's what I was thinking. Mm. Thank you for sharing that, Karen. Appreciate hearing, yeah, just a little bit of your own journey. And the places that these stories tend to intersect with our own journeys and our own wounds and gifts. I am broadcasting a message to the rooms, closing the rooms in one minute. So we'll start having others rejoin so we can continue with the story. Okay, sounds good. And it might be next time we'll just do a full group discussion because um, it did seem like there were some that were in the rooms on their own or not joined. Okay. Yeah, we'll just see how many people we've got and we can. Yeah. From there. I say thank you and I need to go now. I will okay. watch the replay. I'm joining in from Fintorn in um, Scotland and that was oh, definitely wonderful. a big step. Big step for, to leave my normal life and first I moved to a remote Scottish island. So I think I've done my journey and maybe <laughs> I return to the normal world at some point. Lots of love. Thank and you for thank joining you. us. Bye. Bye. <laughs> Just close the rooms and they have one minute to return. So it might be if someone's wrapping up a conversation. There'll be a few more minutes. I mean, not minutes, seconds. Yeah, that sounds good. Well, I'll be back here shortly. Any other thoughts just while we're hanging out, waiting for people to return? With those of us who are here. Judith, I see your your chat message. You're not alone in that. I think I probably, as a moderator for this meeting, need some tech lessons myself. So I think we might do the next break a little bit differently.
I hope some of y'all got benefit from that breakout room experience. Great. Great. I see some nodding heads. Good. Great. Some people were able to connect and have some conversation. Anything that anyone wants to put out to the group? Okay. I see Aaron say, oh, great. Yes. Okay, I'm gonna mute myself so we can go back to the story. Okay. Hmm. So we are eager to return to the story. And then I invite you to just close your eyes maybe envision that place that you left the story. It may be where I left the story or it may be somewhere else. So Vasilisa is walking, walking through the woods and it is night. And as she walks, she comes to twists and turns on this trail. And as she comes to another turn, not sure, not sure which way to go, she reaches into the long, deep pocket of her apron and feels the doll. Asking this doll, which direction do I go? Which way? And sure enough, the doll jumps up and down and says, yes, yes, to the north, to the north, dear one. And so Vasilisa takes some crumbs from the bread that she brought with her, feeding it to the doll, offering her thanks. and turns to the north. And at every twist and turn, Vasilisa asks her doll which direction she should go and receives guidance. And as she's walking, suddenly, a man dressed in white on a white horse gallops by and it becomes daylight. Huh, that's kind of odd, Vasilisa thinks. Still, she carries on her way, continuing to walk on this path, consulting her doll, feeding her crumbs, wondering a bit about a man dressed in white on this white horse. And just as she's wondering about this man, suddenly there's another man dressed in red on a red horse galloping by. And as this man gallops by, the sun rises and it's high noon. Hmm, very odd, Vasilisa says. Still, I must keep going. And then as she is walking, she notices a man dressed in black on a black horse galloping past her. And as he gallops by, it becomes night again. And as she turns her gaze and her attention towards the direction that this man and his horse have galloped. She notices that there's a clearing in front of her. And in this clearing is a house. 
Not just any house, though. This is a very peculiar house. This house is made of bones and stands on chicken legs. But as as Lisa nears closer to this house, she notices that the locks on this house are made of human fingers and toes. The knocker itself of this house is a snout with jagged teeth. Feeling a bit frightened, Vasilisa pauses, staring at this house. And to her surprise, she hears a cackle behind her. <laughs> what are you doing here? And she whips around, and there is Baba Yaga. Now, Baba Yaga is a fearsome creature with long yellow nails and a long pointed nose, her broom made of human hair. She rides in a cauldron. And as she floats down to Vasilisa with a menacing look, what brings you here? Vasilisa pauses, remembering to consult her doll. And the doll responds and Vasilisa responds, well, Baba Yaga, I've come to get fire for my people. <laughs> Fire. I know your people. You stupid girl. What makes you think that I would give you fire? Vasilisa reaches down and consults her doll. Hearing the response. Looks up at Baba Yaga. And says, well, because I ask. Baba Yaga is a bit surprised and a bit annoyed. Nevertheless, she says, lucky for you. Lucky for you, that is the right answer. But first, I must have you do some things for me. I will need you to clean the house, cook the stew, get fire in the hearth, and sort through all this corn, separating the, the mildew corn and the bad corn from the good corn. And if you don't do all of this, well, when I get back, I will kill you and eat you in my stew. Vasilisa is a bit overwhelmed and not sure how she is going to complete this task. And as Baba Yaga flies away, promising her return, Vasilisa reaches into her pocket and consults her doll. And the doll, jumping up and down, says, don't worry. Just go to sleep now. Everything will be taken care of when you awake. And so Vasilisa, trusting that this little doll knows what she's talking about, lays down at the hearth and drifts into a deep sleep. And 
dreaming of the men on the horse, dreaming of her life back home, dreaming of her mother. And sure enough, as she awakes, she smells the stew on the stove. And everything has been cleaned and put to order. And there's fire in the hearth. Baba Yaga comes in. Well, I'm not sure how you accomplished this. But you have. And without really acknowledging, Vasilisa sits down and eats her stew, slurping up every last morsel, licking her lips. Looking over at Vasilisa, Vasilisa is tentatively waiting, wondering what will happen next. Baba Yaga considers the girl, sizing her up. I have one more task for you, little girl. You see all those poppy seeds out there? Out there in the yard? Well, I need you to separate them. Sorting through the good ones and the bad ones. Putting them in the right piles. And if you miss a single one, if one poppy seed is missing, well, I'll kill you and eat you in my stew. And with that, Baba Yaga goes to bed. Snoring, a fearsome snore. Vasilisa, being quite worried, consults her doll. How will we do this? I can't possibly count all these poppy seeds and sort them. And sure enough, the doll replies, don't worry, my dear. Go to sleep and rest. And when you awake, everything will be taken care of. And Vasilisa, trusting the doll, says, okay, all right. And sure enough, she goes to sleep. And when she awakes, all the poppy seeds are sorted. Abiyaga struts in the kitchen certain there is a possible way that Vasilisa would have completed this task. Being quite surprised to see differently. She turns to Vasilisa. You are a clever girl. Hmm. I wonder if there's anything that you would like to ask me, dear child. Vasilisa being a little surprised by the question considers, should she ask? She is curious about these men on the horse. And so she chooses to consult her doll. And her doll nods, giving her approval. And she asks Baba Yaga, who is this man dressed in white on a white horse? And Baba Yaga says, ah, yes. That is my Don. Hmm. Vasilisa nods, not entirely sure what Baba Yaga means, but nevertheless, knowing that maybe too, question, too many questions may irritate Baba Yaga. 
and so settles to move on to the next without getting too much into this white man on a white horse and ask about the man dressed in red on a red horse and she says yes ah yes that is my high noon that is my son and vasilisa considers this and asks, yes and what about the the man on the on the black horse dressed in black ah yes that is my knight Vasilisa considers these answers. Part of her feeling some interest in asking more. In consulting her doll, the doll indicates that enough questions have been asked. Baba Yaga says, ah, yes, dear child. Would you like to ask me some more questions? And Vasilisa, knowing that more questions would not be in her best interest, she replies, no, grandmother, I believe that too much knowledge can make someone old too quickly. And Baba Yaga nods, hmm. Yes, you are very wise, dear one. That is the right answer. And Vasilisa, knowing that this may be her only chance, ask Baba Yaga, grandmother, may I get the fire? Baba Yaga takes one more look at Vasilisa, sizing her up, and then quickly, before Vasilisa can even really think, hands Vasilisa a skull with flaming eyes, pushing it into her hands, saying, take this. Take this, now be on your way. Then she claps her hands and before Vasilisa knows it, she is back in the woods before she can even say thank you. Back in the woods, back on her journey. And as Vasilisa walks through the woods, holding on a stick, this flaming skull, walking back towards her home with the fire. And in her home, the mother and the two stepsisters peer out the window, noticing some sort of light in the woods beyond. quite making it out, feeling certain that Vasilisa has been gone for some time and must be dead. And who's to say? Maybe she is. And as the light nears, they realize Vasilisa is carrying this skull with flaming embers. And as Vasilisa approaches, they are quite surprised, not being quite sure what to say. In fact, they are speechless. Vasilisa brings the fire in, into the house. And every move that these stepsisters and stepmother make, this skull with fiery eyes tracks them, watches them, watches their every move. 
And before long, the eyes of this skull burn the stepmother and the stepsisters into cinders. And that is the story of Vasilisa. Just want to invite you to take a moment and take that in. Noticing the abrupt ending to such a story. Noticing where you are in the story. And I would just invite anyone who feels open to sharing where they're at in the story, takeaways, thoughts that they have. I told you she was going to lock it. <laughs> yeah. The flaming skull reminded me of Ecate. Like um, Baba Yaga as more than just an old witch in the woods. That she, she really keeps this really ancient sacred fire that's not for everybody. Yeah, there is often an old hag in stories that uh, some people perceive as a hag and some people recognize as a sacred grandmother. Um, I shared in a small group that I have been having some health, serious health challenges, and I have a daughter, 30 years old, that has just visited me for six weeks. And um, so I relate to that wanting to impart my wisdom <laughs> to my very smart, gifted, independent, strong 30-year-old female daughter that um, sometimes isn't isn't necessarily wanted or um, embraced in some ways, but that I think that that link, having the doll with her at all time and, and then, and, and getting that kind of intuitive um, direction from her mom is very um, special to me. And the abrupt ending to me is kind of that, um, yeah, transformation that her daughter made, you know, she had gathered some wisdom from this witch in the woods, which, yeah, we all know what witches are really. And, um, it helped her because I, I feel like, uh, my daughter also has that a lot of jealousy and envy from unfortunately other women or other females. So it's kind of interesting, um, to have to rectify that. Yeah, I'm just having it all spin in my head. Oops. There are so many treasures in this story. And I thank you, Callie um, and Betsy, for what you just said. For me, of all the treasures, more knowledge brings about aging process, I thought was beautiful. Thank you so much. Mm, thank you, Maddie. Yeah, and Betsy, to just offer, I, I so appreciate your, um, your connection and, and just your own story um, and where you are in your life, but also this, this piece around passing down wisdom and passing down tradition generation to generation, mother to daughter. Um, and the importance of that and the, the lost art of that um, or the lost practice of that. I mean, we pass it down knowingly or unknowingly, but just the intentionality around your connection to that and your tenderness for your daughter. Hi, Kelly. It's 
Fizz. Sorry, I was driving earlier. I couldn't break out into the rooms. But um, I, I just want to say it's slow reading in a hurried age. That's the first thing that I, I really appreciated, that slow reading, you know, really feeling each word and kind of, you know, sort of igniting my imagination. That was quite beautiful. Um, the second kind of takeaway was sometimes you just got to surrender. You know, some challenges come up and, you know, you just have to trust your instincts and surrender to them and fall asleep, you know, fall asleep to them and let them guide you. Um, that's the kind of take I took. Um, and also that sort of gives you the gift of fire to be able to conquer because sometimes we're limited, you know, we're limited in knowledge and uh, vision of what could happen and what couldn't happen. So sometimes we've got to trust a higher power. And I think that doll was kind of a, a gateway to a higher power. So that's a very, very sort of, you know, <laughs> uh, amateur way of thinking about it. But I thought I'd just share that. Thank you so much. <laughs> Beautiful. Thank you. Yeah, the access to spirit or a higher power. Or God, or however we define that that greater energy. Callie, I want to mention there's um, a chat from Karen. Okay. Um, I feel like each time she looked at the doll, she was connecting to and remembering the love and remembering her loss, which for Karen uh, made her think, uh, what preserves our humanity even in the face of hardship as something as fierce as life? or uh, the grandmother. And I also want to mention that Sharon has her hand up. Thank you, Sharon, for putting your hand up. So thank you. Uh, I just want to convey that I saw uh, the witch being a grandmother as well, and that the witch was uh, invoking impeccable integrity from Vesalia uh, by doing the task without being watched or observed and doing it in an excellent manner. Um, she was teaching the young woman integrity. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, beautiful interpretation. And notice someone said in the chat, the father doesn't have a role other than marriage. This is true in this story, that the masculine doesn't have as, as much of a role, although the men in the woods show up and are, you know, servants and allies to the, to the hag, to the grandmother. And then there's the father. I'm curious if, if there was any other thoughts that went with that or just an observation well, I saw the father as being easily deceived. I mean, he could only see the superficial, the surface, mm -hmm. because the three women are going to show him what he wants to see, his desires, mm -hmm. not what he needs. Mm Beautiful people, I'm aware that we are coming up on one o'clock. So we'll need to close soon. Um, I just want to offer, B, would you mind putting in the chat a couple links to other ways that people can connect with me or you or anybody else at Rites of Passage Council? Um, yeah, we do these. Go I'll, ahead. I'll put in the chat. Um, the first link is the Seasons of Womanhood program that Callie and I and two other women are uh, part of staff um, for uh, women's rites of passage uh, process. Um, you can follow that link if you're interested in that. And I will go to the website and grab the link for um, ROPC, um, their, like their landing page as well. Thank you, B. Yeah. The B and I and two other women are currently uh, doing, uh, we're getting ready to start at the end of this month, um, the next round of the Seasons of Womanhood program, and it's a nine month program. Um, and there are three parts and you can do one, two or, you know, all three. 
but anyways, it's a really beautiful way to deepen into some of this rites of passage work if this sparked your interest and you are hungry for more. And then we do these storytelling events usually in the first in the winter period right before spring so there'll be more coming um, that time next year and we also have uh, a few vision quest programs coming up and a grief ritual that we do so many opportunities to deepen into conversation about this and just being in community and doing this work together so i'm really grateful for all the people who showed up to be in a story with me today Thank you all. Yes, thank you for all joining us. Susanna, you have your hand up. Hi. Hi. Um, so a little question. Thank you first for the story and for the for the share. It's uh, perfect timing. <laughs> um, but I wanted to ask actually, because I know that you are on the other side uh, of the of the sea. Yeah, I'm in Slovenia, I'm in Europe, joining from Europe. And I've been interested in the grief work for a while. I mean, since Malidoma Somme work and his wife. Um, and I never actually had a chance um, to, to do it with somebody. And I wonder, will you be offering something that somebody can learn to to do the grief work it's start, it's it's missing in in my community it's missing like it's missing simply um so i um i do hold rites of passages for women here in slovenia um so it is part of my you know my my journey and so for the moment i'm simply asking do you plan somewhere down the road because it's been calling me like for a couple years it's like coming and going and coming and going yeah. and yeah so that's uh <laughs> and and um yeah and offering it in europe not in that part of the world yeah. or online <laughs> yeah yeah i appreciate yeah. the question susanna i really yeah. yeah i appreciate the the call to do that work and to learn more about that work and uh, currently, we do not have any trainings for the grief ritual in Europe or in the UK. We do have a 16 month uh, training and in person training that meets over the course of 16, maybe it's 18 months, but a little over a year. Um, you meet six times and one of those trainings is specifically about ancestral grief work. Um, but it is a larger, it's a bigger training. It's going through um, the, the different stages of rites of passage and the different types of work that we do at rites of passage council. And it's an 18, 16 or 18 month, can't quite remember, but program um, mm -hmm. where you get to drop in more deeply. Mm -hmm. And that is here in the U.S. Um, yeah, we do, we do. So that's a challenge for, for all of you. I know at the, in the UK, we do have a few of you who are um, able to do the training right now who are actually from the UK who are in the current training because it's spaced out over several months at a time. They were able to make it happen. But yeah, I understand that can be challenging, too. So hopefully one day we'll be able to offer more trainings over there. That would be great. Yeah. And there has been uh, the grief ritual offered over in the UK um, mm -hmm. at least two or three times, I believe, over the past few years. So we're certainly open to um, taking the ritual itself um, overseas. Um, is it is it as a as a ceremony or as a training? The one that you're mentioning in UK. Um, it's been as a ceremony. Okay. Yeah. 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 Okay. Um, but I love the question, and I will certainly munch on that because my heart um, loves the grief ceremony um, itself, and I, I agree it's a it's a well needed um, yeah. training to get out into the world. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, be well, and hope to see you again sometime around the circle. <laughs> thank you all yeah thanks for coming everybody thank you thank you very much
Thank you. Mm.